Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greg Sutton. I am a professor of life sciences at the University of Lincoln. I, my specialty is biomechanics, and today I'm going to be talking about springs, gears, gy gyroscopes, and shock absorbers, or in other words, I'm going to be talking about insect jumping, and which is just a weird thing to talk about. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but we're going to talk about the mechanics and the machinery that goes on in the bodies of insects when they jump. Now, at the, so e this talk has a series of parts. And so at the end of each part of the talk, I, uh, during the talk, I can't see your questions. But at the end of each part, I will pull out, have a look at the comments, answer questions, and then I'll move on to the next part of the talk. And we can spend as long or as little on any individual question as the audience likes. So I'm going to start today by talking about two jumping animals. On the left, we've got human beings. And on the right, we've got grasshoppers. And both of these animals can jump about a half a meter in the air. A human being can jump about 50, 50 60 centimeters. A grasshopper can do 50, 60 centimeters. Both of them have a similar takeoff velocity, three meters a second. But what's often said is that, yes, but grasshoppers are so much smaller that their jump height is so much larger relative to their size that they're much more impressive jumpers. Well, turns out that how high an animal jumps is relative to its size isn't important. It's the absolute number that's important. And this was originally argued by a guy named Giovanni Alfonso Borelli in the 16th century, who has one of the greatest names in science. And Giovanni Borelli uh, argued that if you have two animals of different sizes, is it better to be big to jump high or small to jump high. And he realized that when you get bigger, you can, you have more mass, you get more muscle to generate jump height, but you also have more mass that you need to move. And the amount of muscle you get and the amount of mass you have goes at the exact same rate. So two animals, a one gram animal and a hundred gram animal should be able to jump the absolute, um, the absolute same height. Um, the way to think about this is if you think of one grasshopper that can jump 50 centimeters off the ground, two grasshoppers holding hands can have to have twice as much mass, can jump the same height 50 centimeters. Another way to look at this is the Shigeru Miyamoto method to look at it, where Super Mario and Normal Mario both jump the, the same absolute height. So how high an animal jumps relative to its size isn't that important. But what's important is how long it takes the animal to get off the ground. A human being takes about 300 milliseconds to generate that height, 1g of acceleration, and a grasshopper does it in 30 milliseconds or one tenth of time or 10 g's of acceleration. And that time, the, the amount of time it takes runs into a barrier with something that muscles have a difficulty doing. So the reason that time is important is if we think about a muscle, this is a standard muscle, vertebrate muscle, humans, dogs, cats, insects, fish, muscles, all pretty much the same stuff. And the faster a muscle contracts, the less force it can generate. The faster it moves, the smaller the force. Now, force times velocity um, for the mechanical engineers is power. Um, and this is the same power that goes into light bulbs. And this limit of how much force, that this limit caused by the faster a muscle contracts, less force it generates, causes a limit on how much power it can generate or how quickly it can generate energy. And that limit for a muscle is about 100 watts for one kilogram of muscle. So a kilogram of muscle, any kind of muscle, can generate a maximum of about 100, 200 watts of mechanical power. So if we think about how fast 30 milliseconds is, um, you can see a, a blink of an eye here filmed with a standard video camera. And this is a grasshopper jump filmed with a standard video camera. And the grasshopper jump is too fast to be filmed. But if we slow down the eye blink with a high speed video camera going a thousand frames a second, where an eye blink, which is usually 100 milliseconds, is slowed down to, to about six seconds, you can measure 
how long it takes the grasshopper to generate that 30 millisecond jump or how long it's generating energy to gen calculate how much power is generated during the jump. And this can be plotted on a, plot, a graph where I have here, this is the maximum amount of power that a muscle can generate, about 100 watts per kilogram. And this is a logarithmic graph, 10 watts per kilogram, 1,000 watts per kilogram, 10,000. And grasshoppers are at about 2,000 to 4,000 watts per kilogram, an order of magnitude more power than can be generated by standard muscle. And if you look at the other jumping insects, all the jumping insects are generating more mechanical power than muscle could do alone. Um, 10,000 watts per kilogram, some of them are as high as 60,000 watts per kilogram. And if you wanted to know what this power output would look at our size level, it uh, turns out Wonder Woman, if you saw the Wonder Woman movie, she's at about 8,000 watts per kilogram. So these insects are generating energy in a very short amount of time. And that speed at which they're generating the energy is, is the important part of insect jumping. Now, how are insects doing this? They're doing this with a trick. Um, if you have a muscle, just a sem uh, accelerating mass, you can get 100 watts per kilogram of muscle. There's not a lot you can do. But if you take the muscle and you attach it to a spring, and then you latch everything in place, and then contract the muscle, that muscle will generate the energy and generate energy for a long time and store energy in that spring. So the muscle will generate energy, 100 watts per kilogram over a period of time, allowing it to store the energy in the spring. But then once the energy is stored in the spring, you unlatch the system and the spring can recoil, returning the energy that's stored in it much more quickly than the muscle generated, generated the energy allowing the energy to be uh, put into the system in an incredibly short time, generating an enormous amount of mechanical power. And this is the trick insects use. And we, humans, we use this trick. This is exactly the same trick we here in England use to kill the French. This is how an archery bow works. When an archery bow, you, when you try to fire an arrow, if you try throwing the arrow, your muscles can't generate energy fast enough to put a lot of energy in the arrow to fire to make the arrow go very quickly. So what we do is we put the arrow into a bow and slowly contract our muscles, which stores energy in the bow itself. And then when we release their fingers from the archery bow, the release, the recoil of the bow puts the energy in the arrow much more quickly than we could have done it with our muscles. And these mechanical archery bow animals, there's a lot of animals that use tricks like this. Grasshoppers use it to jump, mantis shrimp use it to crack clam shells, and trap jaw ants use them to slam their jaws together. There's an army of animals that use this trick to generate huge amounts of power. Now for the grasshopper, this spring is in their knee. This is the femur, this is the tibia. And in the knee, before it jumps, it latches its legs in place and bends this structure in its knee called the semilunar process. And that stores the energy that's generated by this incredibly large muscle. And then once the energy is stored, the animal unlatches the leg and shoots itself into the air. So it is, so the grasshopper is basically an archery bow shooting itself. It's shooting itself as the arrow using this spring in its legs. Now, if we look at this spring, a cross-section of this spring, um, there's two distinct layers. This is just a detail I'll come back to later on, where there's an outside layer of very hard black structure and an inside layer of fluorescent blue structure. So it's a layered spring, two, two layers in it. Now, the grasshopper sets up the spring recoil such that the spring recoil of each leg um, is pointing the force on the grasshopper jumping in the same direction. So if a grasshopper has one leg, it has no difficulty jumping because both legs apply force in the same direction. And if it, if it jumps with only one leg, uh, it's just half as much force pointed in the same direction. So it's a very clean, easy movie to direct. Grasshoppers also sometimes slip. 
And if their legs slip, it also doesn't create a problem in the jump direction because both legs, our forces are pointing in the same direction and it catapults it forward. Except if you look at the back leg during this jump, the back leg slips, but then you see, back leg slips, and then you see all of this oscillation. And that back leg will bend if it slips. So if, the, if an animal slips when it jumps, the direction of the jump isn't affected, but the leg will bend a recoil in on itself. And you can, you can get animals to do this regularly. You can get them to kick at you and, and reproduce this bend. And this bend, you can see this bend here. This is a movie at 10,000 frames a second. So this is all happening in one millisecond. And sometimes this bend can be incredibly drastic. You can see the whole thing just recoiling and oscillating right there. And that's, this bend is a shock absorber that, um, that absorbs energy when a leg slips. And the reason why the shock absorber is here is that this spring that stores energy for the jump is very easily damaged. And if the thing is damaged, the whole leg will collapse in on itself when it tries to store energy in this spring. So if a leg slips, it can't use the spring to, to absorb the energy again. So it uses the shock absorber in its leg and that shock absorber helps prevent damage to the spring in the, in the animal's knee. So we've got a spring and we've got a shock absorber in a locust leg, helping it generate these very nice, clean, stable jumps. So I'm going to talk about our second insect today. This is a frog hopper. Frog hoppers are small insects about one centimeter long. They live on foliage. If you've ever seen cuckoo spit on uh, various plants, these are little guys who live in there. And these guys go from stationary to about five meters a second. The grasshopper gets to three meters a second. These guys go to five meters a second in one millisecond. So these guys are an order of magnitude less time than the 30 millisecond grasshopper jump. Every time they jump, they experience 427 Gs of acceleration. Um, 427 Gs of acceleration. These guys are generating 30,000 watts per kilograms of muscle. Just for scale, uh, the largest acceleration ever survived by a human being it was a Formula One driver who, who experienced 180 Gs of deceleration when his car hit a wall. He was intensive care for two months. These guys are doing two to three times that acceleration every time they jump. If you watch them, this is a frog hopper here, this black dot, and this, these lines are both 10 centimeters across. These guys are jumping incredibly fast, incredibly far when they jump. And this film here is, the films of the grasshoppers are at 1,000 frames a second. This film is at 5,000 frames a second, so this is five times a uh, faster frame rate on the camera, and these guys are going incredibly quickly. So how do we generate a jump that quick? We're, we're, all, we're more than 50% faster than the grasshopper. We're doing it in one-tenth of time. And these guys are generating the jump by having their spring is their entire body. Their thorax is this whacking great spring that's used to propel the legs forward. So we've got the same kind of layering of an, of an outside black darker cuticle and inside fluorescent blue cuticle. And the way it uses this huge spring in order to jump, and this would be like if we jumped using our rib cage as, as the spring, is the animal has its legs and then there's an, a tendon that attaches from its legs to this huge muscle all the way on the inside of its body. And it first brings its leg up to the locked position, and then it contracts this huge muscle that bends its whole thorax. And that bends the bow, loading, loading the bow like the bow loads the arrow. And this huge contraction is generating a large amount of torque on the leg. And then the animal releases, the, releases that lock and that pull the, the recoil of the bow pulls these tendons and that shoots the legs out, generating these incredibly fast jumps. 
This is just like an archery bow. And in fact, it's so much like an archery bow, even you look at the structure. Both the springs in the grasshopper and the spring in the frog hopper both have two distinct layers, an outside layer of black cuticle and inside layer of fluorescent cuticle. And this is very similar to the two layering in a composite archery bow where there's an outside layer of horn and an inside layer of wood. And this layering in a composite bow, most famously used by the Mongolians, is used to help keep the, prevent the bow from being damaged over repeated use and prevent the bow from creeping. Or you can, or in other way, other words, if you keep a bow made out of one piece of wood strung, the bow will slowly start to warp and lose tension. And if you fire it over and over again, the bow will lose mechanical properties and become harder and harder to use until it breaks. But with a composite bow, it keeps the mechanical properties the same and you can fire it over and over again and it doesn't lose stiffness or lose tension. So that's the spring in the frog hopper, but the frog hopper has a problem because the frog hopper's legs are to the left and to the right of its body. And the left leg puts a torque in the clockwise direction on the body in this diagram. And the other leg puts an equal but opposite torque in the anti-clockwise or counterclockwise, or I like to think Wittershins direction. It's a fun word, Wittershins. Uh, and in order to jump, it needs to balance these two torques, otherwise it'll spin out of control. And if one leg goes before the other, and here we've got a film of a frog hopper where this, the left leg will go 100 microseconds before the right leg. This is at a 5,000 frames a second, and you can see that this frog hopper spins. It doesn't generate a nice forward jump, it spins if the legs go at different times. This almost never happens to a frog hopper, and by almost never happens, oh, this spin rate is at 2,000 RPMs, um, so, because we've got it so slowed down, this is 12,000 degrees a second or 2,000 RPMs, but this almost never happens, and by almost never happens, filmed 250 jumps from six species of frog hopper, that's the only asynchronous jump I've ever seen. The other 249 times, both legs extended at exactly the same time within 100 microseconds of one another. Now, this is a difficult thing to synchronize because the human, well, a nervous system, human nervous system, uh, insect nervous system, slug nervous systems, nervous systems are only good at synchronizing things down to about a millisecond because that's how long it takes to generate a signal. And if you take a frog hopper and look at its hind legs, here we've got the left femur, the right femur, and then film it at 30,000 frames a second, which is incredibly fast. Um, if you saw this movie, this is Days of Future Past, at this frame rate of 30,000 frames a second, put up to a standard movie speed, a bullet would move about three millimeters a second. So we are looking at a frog hopper leg extension at about the same frame rate as this scene from the movie where Quicksilver is moving the bullets around with his finger. That's how fast a bullet would move if filmed with this camera. But if we look at the, this, the left femur and the right femur, we're gonna see that the left femur will go two frames before the right femur. And this was the maximum asynchrony we noticed. So these, these legs are incredibly highly synchronized to within 60 microseconds of one another when they jump 99% of the time, or 249 out of 250. How do you get that kind of synchrony? Well, that kind of synchrony, there's a lot of ways that the insects do it, but the wildest one is this is, is this coleoptrotus. This guy lives on ivy in, in England. And the nymphs do it by, if you look at their left and their right legs, the legs are up against one another before they jump. And prior to the jump, they roll their legs over these little bumps. And you can see the insect getting ready to prepare for the jump here. And then when the insect jumps, you can see it here. And these bumps are gears. This insect is using a pair of gears that interacts with it. its left and right legs, have geared structures that interact with one another, keep the legs extending at exactly the same time. 
wildly, the only gears, wildly, um, only the nymphs have the gears. When the adults grow to their last molt, the adults have friction pad and they don't use the gears anymore and we're not entirely sure why. So we've got springs, we've got shock absorbers, and we've got gears in insects. So I'm gonna stop at this section and check to see if there are any questions thus far. So do we have any questions, comments? Do we have anyone in the show yet? Ben, is anybody here? Okay, well, I'll just keep going. So, slideshow from current slide. So we've got gears, we've got gears, we've got springs, we've got shock absorbers. Now, trap giants, use this kind of system to slam their jaws together. A grasshopper does it in 30 milliseconds. A frog hopper does it one millisecond. This trap jaw ant is able to slam its jaws together in 100 microseconds, doing catastrophic damage to anything it happens, well, to any insect or something small that it bites. They're not strong enough to, to get through our skin. And this is, this is an extremely powerful motion, and these guys make them, the trap jaw ants are the biggest antagonists in the rainforest where they live. Ah, anyway, they are incredibly threatening to the other insects that are near their size and to even things bigger than them. In this bottom right, I've got a picture of a trap jaw ant doing horrific damage to a frog it has found. And if we look at how much power these trap jaw ants are generating to slam their mandibles together in 100 microseconds, these guys are generating 400,000 watts for every kilogram of muscle they have, or they're eight times the mightiest frog hopper or as powerful as 50 Wonder Women. These are incredibly powerful mo motions. Uh, how are they doing it? Well, if you look at the anatomy of the trap jaw head, we've got the ant head on the left and then the internal structures that are doing it. There's the mandible here, there's a short little tendon and apodeme and these long muscle fibers. There doesn't appear to be a spring inside the head. We don't see anything long. The apodeme can do some stretching, but not a lot. Where is the spring? Well, we know these are powerful. They can actually take their jaws and slam them on the ground to catapult them into the air. But where's the spring for the system? Well, if you look at a trap giant, I've got two trap jaw ants with their heads loaded here. And then we look at the, the head after it recoils. So here we've got it loaded, ready to strike. Here you've got the mandible striking after the strike, loaded, strike, loaded, strike. Look at the shape of the head. This whole head, and if we look at the right one, strike, ready, strike. The spring is not inside the trap jaw ant. The spring is inside the head of the trap jaw ant. The spring is the head of the trap jaw ant. When the animal prepares for a strike, it pulls on those muscles so hard that it deforms the entire head of the, head of the ant. And that deformation then when the animal releases the jaws, the deformation slams the jaws together, generating this incredibly powerful strike and allowing them to even jump. So we have an animal here that its whole head is a spring for generating this incredibly powerful motion. So we'll talk, so that's trap jaw ants. So now I'm gonna talk about another uh, jumping insect. This is a praying mantis. Now, praying mantises are lovely, lovely guys and girls, and they will happily jump to paintbrushes if you give them a paintbrush to jump to. They will happily jump to them. It's absolutely wonderful. So at 1,000 frames a second, if we look at the power output for a praying mantis, it's at about 80 to 100 watts per kilogram. So they're not using a spring to generate their jump. They're just doing it with their muscles. 
But if you look at the, carefully at the animal, you can see that it generates a spin of its body to align itself with the paintbrush before it lands. And this whole movie is about a half a second long of material. There's 400 milliseconds of time. So this whole spinning it's doing to align itself with the paintbrush is done incredibly quickly. And it can do it with, for paintbrushes that are close. It can do it for paintbrushes that are far away. This is a very long paintbrush jump. It can get it and it rotates its body very quickly in the air to control to align to the paintbrush. Now the way it does this is two steps. First, look at what it does with its thorax, I'm sorry, with its abdomen before it jumps. It curls its abdomen up, curls its abdomen up, and then pushes off with its legs. And that abdomen curl, that abdomen curl moves its center of mass vertically so that the force from the legs will put an anti-clockwise torque on the body. And we can test that by doing something to prevent the animal from curling its abdomen up. If we put a little bit of wax on the abdomen so it can't curl the abdomen up, so the force on the leg stays going through the center of mass, if you prevent that abdomen curl, turns out the animal can't jump in, can't generate that spin and hits the, hits the paintbrush straight on. So it curls its abdomen up to give itself the initial angular momentum to start the rotation. But then during the, while it's in the air, Look at what it does with the abdomen and its front limbs while it's in the air. It curls the abdomen up, but then it flicks the abdomen down, kicks its legs down, and swings its front, front raptoral appendages. It's doing high-speed mid-air acrobatics to, once it starts spinning, to control the spin in the air so the animal can land cleanly on the target paintbrush it's jumping to. It's using its angular, it's using its limbs and its abdomen as angular momentum reservoirs to help do the acrobatics in the air. Now, this is exactly the same as in the ancient Greek Olympics. The Greek uh, acrobats used to have something called halteris. Uh, they were called jumping stones, halteris, something to jump with in Greek. And they would, these stones would allow the acrobat to control angular momentum in the air by moving its limbs, moving the, the athlete's limbs. And the praying mantises are doing exactly the same thing to use, the, use its large limbs and its abdomen to control its angular momentum and help it be a gyroscope as it's going, as it's going through the air. Now, some animals, some jumping animals don't jump with that much spin when they jump. You know, for example, fleas, they more or less shoot off like a bullet. So fleas aren't the greatest jumpers in the world. They're going to 1.5 meters a second. Grasshoppers are three. Frog hoppers go to five meters a second. Um, but the uh, flea more or less shoots off like a bullet when it jumps. But some jumping creatures do absurdly high spins. Here we've got a psyllid. This is at 5,000 frames a second. This guy is going at about 10,000 RPMs every time it jumps. Psyllids can generate a slower non-rotational jump. Um, here we've got a psyllid doing that. But most of the time when psyllids jump, they generate these very high spins. So fleas fly out like a bullet. Mantises control their spin very precisely. And psyllids just shoot out at incredibly high rotational speeds. So some insects have very different relationships with spin. And then we, last, I'm going to talk about the ninja spin jumpers. This is the bush cricket. Bush crickets are spectacular spin jumpers. Um, these guys are about five centimeters long. They've got huge long legs, eight centimeters long, stationary three meter milliseconds and 100 milliseconds, three Gs. They're not generating a lot of power, 100 watts per kilogram of muscle. But what they can do is bush crickets are able to generate spins incredibly precisely so that they can align themselves with targets. And here we've got a, a, a bush cricket doing a spin of over 360 degrees 
to hit the wall, the opposite wall. So this is at a thousand frames a second. This whole film is about 400 milliseconds long. This animal is doing a 360 and then some spin to land on a wall in front of it. So these guys are ninja spin jumpers and have no trouble generating more than 360 degree rotations to land on a wall. Or alternatively, this, this bush cricket is generating a 180 degree rotation to land on a ceiling with no issues whatsoever. And this is, this is, also, this is all being done in 200 to 300 milliseconds. So various, in, so, so insects are not only controlling, generating these speeds in a very short a period of time, they're also generating vast and intense spins. So I began talking about the comparison of humans and grasshoppers, but really why I do what I do is because of the variation of, among various animals and insects. So here we've got all of the species of animals that exist in one pie graph. And the chordates are everything with, a, everything with a backbone. So this is your mother, your father, your friend, your dog, your cat, a mouse, kangaroo. Everything with a backbone is this tiny little red graph here. And that's where we live. But these grasshoppers represent a jumping from the arthropods or, or the insects, and the arthropods, the insects. And that's really two thirds of all the species in the world are, are these insects. And if we look at the groups of insects, uh, the, for example, the grasshoppers are orthopterans, so they're in this gray band. The psyllids, the frog hoppers, and the isis plant hoppers are all in this group called the hemiptera. Uh, the bush crickets are in Orthoptera, the ants are in Hymenoptera, the fleas are in Siphonoptera, and the mantises are in the Mantodia. But the point I want to make with this graph is the wide, wide world of insects. We haven't even really begun to touch the surface as to what jumping insects can do. They're very different from one another. Some of them can jump with one leg, some of them can't. The grasshoppers have no trouble doing it. The uh, the frog hoppers cannot jump with one leg. Some of them have gears. They've got shock absorbers. Some of them can control their rotation precisely. Some of them cannot. But with so many different kinds of insects doing so many different kinds of jumps, it's a huge variable world. And that world exists in the field outside your house. None of these insects are terribly foreign. Um, they're the all of these that I've showed you here, with the exception of the mantis and the trap giant, live in England. Uh, you can get them. The frog hoppers and grasshoppers are absolutely ubiquitous, and it's an entirely rich research space of a lot of interesting questions, a lot of interesting animals, and they're all nearby, and we can all get at them. So that's what I have to say today about jumping insects. Um, here we've got an example of sometimes when an insect jumps, or say a mantis is jumping to something, it doesn't always go doesn't always go perfectly well. Um, this is also a high speed movie, so this whole thing you're seeing is happening over one second. Yeah, and the mantis doesn't quite make it. You ever have that day? You ever have that day at work? So that's what I have. And do we have any questions? Any other questions? Oop. Oh, oh, we, we have people. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. So um, the Bush Cricket movies are filmed at Link University of Lincoln. Uh, the Bush Cricket movie and the Grasshopper movies are filmed at the University of Lincoln, except for the Semilunar Process movie, which was filmed when I was at Cambridge. Um, the Trap Giant movies were filmed at Duke University when I was there, and the Mantis movies were filmed at Cambridge when I was there. Um, what's my favorite insect? Okay, uh, my favorite insect, I love the frog hoppers. Um, they're really wonderful, easy to look at. They fire off like bullets. And if you get a chance, what you should do is find a frog hopper. They come out in June and July 
and then you can get them with a standard net. You can see them on the bushes if you look through the look bushes or fields. Get a frog hopper on your on your hand and feel it jump off. You can feel the amount of force in the legs that it's generating with that that uh, spring in its body, and and you can hear it. It's an audible click when they jump too. So there's just so much power and so much force in such a small insect. I absolutely love it. Um, do we have other questions? How many people are in the room? Is there an ability to check that? Um, how long have I done this? I have been doing, I've been looking at jumping insects for about 14 years now. Whoa. Um, I started, I came to England 14 years ago. I did my PhD in slugs, in slow motions of slug mechanics, and started reading papers coming out of England on jumping grasshoppers. Ah, five people, fantastic. Um, started doing work on jumping grasshoppers, and just one thing led to another. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, so which is why I spend all day tallying how much joules of energy, the watts of power, the spin rates, and so on and so forth. So do you have any questions about the, the insects? Yes, please look at the frog hoppers. Nobody has any other questions? Okay, cool beans, cool beans. Um, I have to ask my handler, should I just wait? Um, uh, ben, spray cheese? 